it's not just that we're seeing changes in the gut associated with neurological diseases like Parkinson's. It's that these changes in the gut are occurring sometimes decades before the neurological symptoms develop. I'm Dr. Robin Chutkan, gastroenterologist, microbiome expert, and author, and I am here to help you find gut bliss. We're kicking off today's show, the second in my Gut Brain series, with a question from someone in our Gut Bliss community. I'm a healthy middle-aged woman. I've recently experienced constipation. I exercise five to six times per week. I drink about eight glasses of water a day. I eat a fiber-rich diet, lots of fruits and vegetables. I really haven't changed anything. I'm not taking any medication except for some magnesium at night. I've had my thyroid checked. I had a colonoscopy in the last year. It showed a redundant colon, but otherwise it was normal. So it's a mystery to me why this change has occurred. I have a parent with Parkinson's, and the reason I have this question for you is that I've seen some research on the connection between the gut and Parkinson's, specifically on constipation and Parkinson's. So I'm wondering, is it possible that this new onset of constipation could be an early warning sign? And if so, is there anything I should be doing to investigate? In 1817, a British physician published a paper describing a series of patients with unusual symptoms. The patients were weak and they had trembling that started in their hands and then progressed throughout their entire body so that eventually even really simple functions like walking and eating and swallowing became impossible. The physician called this illness the shaking palsy, although today we refer to it as Parkinson's disease in honor of that physician, Dr. James Parkinson, who first described it. But more than 200 years later, we still don't really know what causes Parkinson's disease. We know that our genes play a role only about 10% of the time, so this isn't really a genetic disease. So what I can tell my listener is that she's pretty unlikely to have inherited Parkinson's from her parent, because only about 1 in 10 people have some sort of genetic connection. So that's actually really good news. I also would advise her not to be too worried about the constipation because the reality is constipation is way more common than Parkinson's. And most people who are constipated, it's not because they have Parkinson's or going to develop it. Plus, we have a couple clues there. Her gastroenterologist told her after her colonoscopy that she had a redundant colon, which is really a sort of, I think, not so nice way of describing a twisty curvy colon, more common in women for a lot of reasons. And if you're interested, check out episode three of the Gutless podcast, The Voluptuous Venus Colon, one of my favorite episodes, actually. So this redundant colon is a pretty common cause of constipation. And she's also in that perimenopausal age group where anatomical and hormonal changes can definitely make you more constipated. Your pelvic floor can start to shift and your estrogen levels start to fluctuate and all of a sudden you are super constipated. But her question that I'm going to be answering next and spending most of the time answering is whether or not there may be a connection between what's going on in the gut and what's going on in the brain in a disease like Parkinson's and even more importantly, what should we be doing to investigate that connection? Coming up, the gut first theory. The Gut Bliss Podcast is brought to you by VizBiome, my first and quite frankly, my only choice for a probiotic. Whether you're dealing with irritable bowel syndrome or just looking to restore your gut health, VizBiome can help. It's a medical food for the dietary management of IBS and gut inflammation. Backed by science and clinically vetted by thousands of my own patients. Find your gut bliss with VizBiome. Go to visbiome.com backslash gut bliss and use discount code gut bliss at checkout. We think of a disease like Parkinson's as a neurological disease, and it is because it involves damage to parts of the brain and specifically the part of the brain that controls movement. There's a loss of nerve cells that make dopamine in that part of the brain, and dopamine regulates movement. And that's why people with Parkinson's disease have abnormal movements. We consider it a movement disorder. But the million-dollar question is what causes a damage to the brain in the first place? 
And one clue comes from Dr. Parkinson himself two centuries ago. He reported that some of the patients he was taking care of with shaking palsy were extremely constipated. And when their constipation was treated and improved, so did their neurological symptoms. Constipation is actually one of the most common symptoms with Parkinson's. About two-thirds of all patients with Parkinson's disease complain of constipation. And another important clue, the constipation in Parkinson's usually starts before their neurological symptoms, decades before in some cases. It turns out Parkinson's isn't just a brain disease. It's also a gut disease. And the changes in the gut can occur before the changes in the brain, leading to what we now call the gut first theory. So this is a theory that was proposed about 20 years ago by a German scientist, an anatomist named Dr. Brock, and it's sometimes called the Brock theory. And Dr. Brock did autopsies in patients with Parkinson's, and he was looking at the brain in patients who had died with Parkinson's or from Parkinson's. And what he was looking for in these autopsies is an abnormally folded protein called alpha-synuclein. And this abnormally folded protein is the hallmark finding in the brain in people with Parkinson's. It's anatomy 101 or pathology 101 is seeing these abnormal lesions. They're called Lewy bodies. And again, they're these clumps of abnormally folded protein. But here's the thing. Nobody knew where those proteins in the brain were coming from. We know that the brain is connected to the gut through nerves in the body, like the vagus nerve. And so Dr. Brock decided to look in the digestive tract to see if these abnormal proteins in the brain might be coming from the digestive tract. And they were. He found clumps of alpha-synuclein in the gut, in the stomach, and in other parts of the digestive tract. And then a study a few years later, in 2016, analyzed tissue samples from the digestive tract of 39 people who would later be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. 22 of them had alpha-synuclein, that abnormal protein, present in their gut samples as much as 20 years before their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But how was the alpha-synuclein getting from the gut to the brain? Well, studies in mice confirmed that alpha-synuclein can travel from the gut to the brain. And to show this, to demonstrate how that happened, they injected alpha-synuclein into the stomach and small intestine of healthy mice. And after about a month, they saw increased levels of alpha-synuclein in the brainstem, which then spread throughout the midbrain and the cortex. And this was mirroring exactly what Dr. Brock was seeing in his autopsy subjects. By about 10 months, clumps of alpha-synuclein were riddling the entire brain, and the mice, they were developing signs of Parkinson's disease. So now researchers were able to confirm that alpha-synuclein was originating in the gut and that it could travel to the brain and that it could produce Parkinson's disease. So the next question was how and why was alpha-synuclein forming in the gut in the first place? And to answer that question, we have to look deeper than just the anatomy of the digestive tract. We have to look, of course, at the microscopic community in the gut, the trillions of microorganisms that reside there, known as the microbiome. The next step in this quest to connect what's going on in the gut with what's going on in the brain was to look at the gut microbiome in people with Parkinson's and compare it to healthy people. And that's exactly what a study published in the journal Nature Communications did. They looked at the gut microbiome in about 500 people with Parkinson's, and they identified 85 different species of bacteria in the gut that were associated with Parkinson's. Some of the species were increased and others were decreased. Some of the species that were increased were linked to the abnormal clumping of the alpha-synuclein protein. And some of the ones that were decreased were involved in gut motility, which helps to explain why constipation is such a common problem for people with Parkinson's. Another type of bacteria that was present in lower than normal levels in Parkinson's was a species that protects the brain against toxins. And that helped to explain the brain damage that we see in Parkinson's disease. So given these significant findings linking what's going on in the gut microbiome in Parkinson's to what's going on in the brain, 
it makes sense that we're now looking at methods to try and alter the gut microbiome to see if we can alter the brain. One recent study from Belgium replaced the gut bacteria in people with Parkinson's with gut bacteria from healthy donors via something called FMT, fecal microbiota transplantation, otherwise known as a poo transplant. After about 12 months, the Parkinson's group that was receiving FMT saw significant improvements in their symptoms compared to the placebo group that wasn't receiving a stool transplant. And, and they also had less constipation. So this study suggested that altering the gut microbiome with a stool transplant could have long-lasting benefits in Parkinson's. But I want you to keep in mind that it took a full year for the group who received the FMT to see significant improvement. And this is very similar to what we've seen in other studies with FMT, with stool transplants, for autoimmune diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. This is not a one-and-done situation. Most of these chronic conditions are going to require FMT if they respond at all, but they're going to require it at least a couple times a week for prolonged periods of time, and sometimes indefinitely. FMT can be a really effective way to alter someone's gut microbiome, but it has a pretty high yuck factor. I love stool, but I am not that excited about the prospect of someone else's stool in my body. So what's another really effective way to alter the gut microbiome besides a stool transplant? changing your diet, arguably the most effective way to change your ecosystem in your gut. A Harvard study on Parkinson's showed that people who ate a lot of high-fiber plant foods, including fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, those people on the high-fiber diet had a lower risk of developing Parkinson's. And you don't have to be vegan to benefit. That's the beauty of this study. People who also ate lean protein and small amounts of saturated fat were also in the low risk group for Parkinson's as long as they were eating plenty of high fiber plant foods. Another study that looked at diet and the gut microbiome in patients with Parkinson's disease, also published this year in the journal Nature, found that a diet high in fiber and low in added sugar has a positive influence on Parkinson's risk and progression by decreasing what we call neuroinflammation, the inflammation in the brain that's associated with damage, loss of the dopamine. In this study, they found a reduction in the levels of inflammatory bacteria that are usually increased in Parkinson's. Furthermore, the high-fiber, low-sugar diet increased the amounts of protective bacteria, the anti-inflammatory bacteria. So their conclusion was that the previously reported microbiome abnormalities in Parkinson's are likely due, at least in part, and probably a major part, to dietary differences between Parkinson's patients and control subjects. Why is this important? It's important because Parkinson's disease is the second most common age-related neurodegenerative disease, second only to Alzheimer's, and it's getting more and more common each year. According to the World Health Organization, Rates of Parkinson's have doubled in the last 25 years. Now, this is a disease that primarily affects older people, particularly people over 65. And older people are definitely living longer in our society. But it's not just age that's a problem here. It's not just that people are older. It's a fact that people's health span is not overlapping with their lifespan. So they're living longer, but in older age, many people are extremely unhealthy. And we know that the health of your microbiome is one of the most important predictors of how you age. And that aging includes not just physical things like mobility and frailty, but also how our brains are aging. Coming up, some good news and an answer to our listener's question about whether there was anything she could do to investigate her risk for Parkinson's disease. We currently don't have a specific test to diagnose Parkinson's disease. The diagnosis is made based on your medical history, a review of your symptoms, and a neurological and physical exam. 
And what this means is that we can really only diagnose Parkinson's when it's pretty clear you already have it. And here's a problem with that. Early intervention is key. All those diet studies I was talking about showed that in early Parkinson's, the microbiome is still modifiable by diet. But once you get to more advanced stages of the disease, the microbiome is much less responsive to dietary change. So early diagnosis and early intervention is key. Ideally, we want to diagnose people who are at high risk and intervene before they get the disease so that they never actually develop Parkinson's. That's the goal. And that's where Dr. Brock and his important discovery about the abnormal protein in the brains of people with Parkinson's, alpha-synuclein, that's where that comes in. Researchers are now studying a Parkinson's test that may be able to detect the disease before symptoms begin. The test is called an alpha-synuclein seed amplification assay. I know that's a mouthful. In a 2023 study, researchers tested the spinal fluid of more than 1,000 people to look for clumps of alpha-synuclein. And the test was accurately able to identify people with Parkinson's about 87% of the time. So that's pretty good, pretty good accuracy. The test was also pretty good at detecting people who were at high risk. So that was super exciting. But here's something even more exciting. A recent study asked the question, since Parkinson's seems to develop in the gut first, what about looking at stool samples to see if we can detect elevated levels of alpha-synuclein there? And that is exactly what researchers did. And what they found was that although in its current state, the test was not great at detecting Parkinson's, it was really good at detecting a condition that is a precursor of Parkinson's disease, a condition called isolated rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, also known as IRBD. And IRBD is strongly associated with Parkinson's disease. About 75% of people with IRBD will develop a condition like Parkinson's disease within about 12 years. So what advice would I give our listener about testing? Although alpha-synuclein seed amplification assay may be available through some doctor's offices, it's really not a standard of care test right now. And there's still a lot of questions about how to interpret the results. It's going to take more research before this test is ready for prime time. So for now, there's no actual recommendation for any screening blood test or screening brain scans or anything like that. But I would recommend that she pay close attention to any symptoms that might develop, like problems with coordination, any tremors, particularly in the hands. And what I want to reassure her is that the overwhelming likelihood is that she is not going to develop this disease. Plus, she's doing all the right things with her diet and lifestyle. She's eating a high-fiber diet. She's drinking lots of water. She exercises regularly. These are all really important things. The one thing that I would tell her is to watch out for her sugar intake and to make sure she's not over-indexing on the sugar. So I want to leave you with three takeaways about the gut-first theory and Parkinson's disease. Number one, your diet is the most powerful tool for changing your microbiome. And if you're eating the wrong foods, those changes that can develop in your gut microbiome can cause neuroinflammation, inflammation in your brain, and put you at risk for diseases like Parkinson's. What kinds of diet increase your risk? Diets that are low in fiber and high in added sugar. Those are the diets that are strongly associated with the changes in the gut microbiome that we see in people with Parkinson's. So you want to eat high fiber and low sugar. Number two, early intervention is key. In early disease, the microbiome is still modifiable by diet, but in more advanced stages of Parkinson's, the microbiome is much less responsive to dietary change. So start now. Increase your fruit and vegetable intake. Decrease your sugar intake. Number three, testing for alpha-synuclein protein, not in the brain or in the spinal fluid, but in the gut, might be the next big frontier for early detection of neuroinflammation that could be an early warning sign of diseases like Parkinson's. 
So that's it for this episode of the Gut Bliss Podcast on the Gut First Theory, the second episode in my series on the Gut Brain Connection. Coming up next week on the Gut Bliss Podcast, we're going to be tackling another neurological condition that is becoming more and more common every day autism spectrum disorder. What's the gut got to do with it? Go to gutbliss.com for my free seven-day microbiome reboot course. If you like what you're hearing, drop a review and hit that subscribe button. And remember, dirt, sweat, vegetables, the best prescription for a healthy gut. The information presented in this show is not meant to be medical advice. Consult your doctor before making any decisions about your health. The patients discussed are real people, but names and identifying features have been changed to protect their privacy.